Hey, sub tours. My name is William Tingle of sub2deals.com. I would like to welcome you to this episode of the Sub2 Deal Show, where we talk about all things subject to. Now, occasionally we will cover other real estate investing topics, but it's always something to help you with your real estate investing business. Today is another episode in our Real Investor series, where we feature real investors sharing real stories and actual deals. These guys are investors doing deals all across the country, sharing tips and strategies and things that are working today in their businesses and in their markets. Uh, they share all of these and they can work for you too. So pay attention and take lots of notes. My guest today is Nick Monge. Nick is an investor uh, in Colorado. Uh, he's working mainly out of the Denver area, but he gets down here in my neck of the woods from time to time. Uh, he's been investing for a few years. Uh, he is still a part-time investor, uh, and he's going to tell us more about that later. So, uh, Nick, welcome to the Sub2 Deal Show. Hey, Will. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here today. Yeah, well, I was excited to have you on. We always enjoy uh, having successful students on here. Nick's actually a member of our coaching group, and he's been in there for a few months. You know, Nick, I remember the first time I spoke with you, I think it was on a... Uh, uh, a discovery uh, JV or coaching call. And we talked a good bit about sub two. As I recall, uh, you were really new to it at the time and you really drilled me with a lot of questions, but man, you've done a phenomenal job here in a short period of time. Congrats to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And honestly, just to kind of tell you up front, everything that I've learned sub two was from your podcast. Just so it's a, it's an absolute honor to be here. I remember I heard something about Sub Two on the Bigger Pockets podcast one day, and I wasn't able to find any resources except for your podcast. So I started listening to it religiously, and that's literally where I learned everything Sub Two. Wow! So I owe it all to you. <laughs> wow! Well, thanks so much, man. We appreciate that. So everybody, listen to the podcast. <laughs> so we're super excited to talk about your story here today, Nick, because like I said, you've done just a phenomenal job. I know we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about some of the deals that you're doing. So I mean, especially in this market, gosh, it's super hot. And especially with the pandemic and everything else. And I, I was telling uh, the guys on the coaching call, actually, uh, a couple of nights ago, that this, I've been doing this for 21 years. I've been in up markets, down markets. I mean, the bottom to the top. And this is the toughest market for finding good deals I've ever been in. So, man, you're out there hitting it. So good for you. Well, tell us a little bit about your background, Nick. What, what did you do before real estate? Tell us about your family and, and what you got going on. Yeah, absolutely. So I was born and raised in Brunswick, Maine. Uh, my dad was in the Navy. He was stationed up there at Brunswick Naval Air Station. Um, so I grew up there pretty much my entire life. Um, right out of high school, I joined the Air Force. Um, so I went in, I ended up doing nine and a half years of active duty. I just actually se separated this past September. So it's only been four or five months since I, you know, officially separated. Um, so I'm married. I have two kids um, in the Air Force. I had an awesome job. It was really cool. You know, I, I was a cyber guy. I did all sorts of that cool spy stuff. I can't really get into it, um, but that's that's what I did. And, you know, throughout my time in the, the Air Force, I got, you know, my bachelor's, I got my MBA. By the time I separated completely, I had so many different job opportunities, especially with my background. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I, I, I just got tired of the, you know, the desk job and being a nine to five uh, employee. Um, and that's really, you know, kind of, I guess, my background before I got into real estate full time. Um, but yeah, uh, my son's eight, my daughter's five. My wife and I have been married for, for eight years now. And uh, we're just loving life here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll tell you when I got started investing, I got started in 1999 and my kids were about the same age. You know, I had a job. I was in the restaurant industry. I worked 70 hours a week and I never saw them. And it, real estate made such a change in our lives. I mean, we took our kids out of school. We started homeschooling. We traveled a bunch. I mean, man, you, you, you guys are, and I know from talking with you, you like traveling. You've been around, of course, being in the service and Thanks for your service, by the way. We certainly appreciate you. Uh, but uh, yeah, you guys are, have got some fantastic times ahead, traveling and doing stuff and not having to be tied to that job like so many people do. So man, good for you. So 
you got an interesting background there. What got you interested in real estate? So I bought my first house in 2013. Um, I just turned 20 years old and I was an E3 in the Air Force. And I, I don't really know exactly what it was that gave me, I don't know, the idea of purchase, purchasing a house. But I do remember one day I was walking through uh, the skiff at work and I, I overheard some, uh, you know, older Air Force guys talking about the VA loan and just purchasing their first house. They were in their mid 30s. And I went up and I asked them, I'm like, hey, tell me more about this. And it's something that I wish the Air Force did. I wish they kind of trained you more on the VA loan when you first join kind of, you know, first term airman course or something, but they don't. Um, So I learned about this and I reached out to my bank, USAA, and they ended up putting me in touch with a realtor who also helped me run numbers. At the time, I was paying $750 for a one bedroom apartment. So in San Antonio, where I purchased, uh, I bought the house for $117,000 and my mortgage was $750. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was, it was kind of a no brainer for me to jump into it. Um, And that was, that turned into my first investment property. Mm -hmm. Um, It was unintentional for it to be an investment property. I ended up keeping it because we got PCS about eight months later, Mm -hmm. but really with like the investing true investing, purposeful investing. It really started in 2018 when me and my wife, we had some dumb debt. Mm-hmm. Um, we had just bought some stuff over the last couple of years that we just didn't need and credit cards started building up and stuff. And I brought up that house in San Antonio because that's actually what we use to leverage getting into investing. Mm-hmm. Um, about six, five or six years after buying that, we ended up building some good appreciation in it. And uh, we ended up selling it and did a 1031 into a quad in Huntsville, Alabama. So we had about $70,000 in equity that we rolled into that quad, didn't have to pay taxes on it because we used the 1031. And uh, the way that I got out of debt was I rolled all of my proceeds into that property, but my dad, he wanted to partner with me. So what he did was he just wired me half of that 70 grand and I used that to pay off the debt that we had. So now we had a... Now we had a cash flowing property, quadplex in a awesome market. I mean, Huntsville is absolutely ridiculous right, right now. And uh, that's, that's really what it, what it came down to. I mean, we just bought a, a property because we wanted to get out of debt. And I learned about, you know, the Bigger Pockets podcast and just started reading and absorbing as much information as I possibly could. And that's just mm-hmm. kind of where it, it, it started. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying about uh, being educated about VAs. You know, VA loans are, are something that we really target uh, as investors because of the exact circumstance that you talk about. You buy a house eight months later, you get orders. You have to go. And and I'm telling you, you know, the vast majority, and I know you know this is true, uh, as, as one of your benefits in a VA loan, that they're not a great loan interest rate wise and, uh, and some other things, but you can get in with zero down. We see them all the time, a $300,000 house, they finance 325 or, or whatever the case is. So they roll all their cost in. And then in a normal market, certainly not like Colorado is today, but in a normal market, a year later, two years later, there's nothing, there's no room Uh, to sell with an agent. So they're stuck. And so many people, uh, you know, veterans, people with VA loans don't understand how the VA loan system works. They think they can only have one at a time. And that's just not the case. You know, we talked to a seller a couple of days ago who just wasn't even aware that in the market they're looking to move in, the cap for VA entitlement now is over half a million dollars, yeah. you know. So you could, you know, if you've got a $200,000 loan on property A and you're getting orders to move across the country, uh, you've still got over $300,000 of borrowing power. Uh, and, and I tell you this too, this is almost unknown, even with investors, VA loans have a built-in provision where the owner can sell the house on a contract for deed without fear of the due on sale clause. And I'm yeah. sure that's in there to help them 
move that property if they have to get across the country or something like that. But, but you're right. I mean, they, they, you guys should understand it's your benefit. You should understand how all that stuff works. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I definitely, I was one of the people that did use that VA loan twice. Mm-hmm. Um, so we bought the house in San Antonio for 117. We got orders up to Maryland and we bought a property there literally not even a year later, mm-hmm. you know, we, we got that second property. And I think the cap in Maryland was 454,000. The property we bought was like two, 270. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I was, I was definitely one of those ones that, that was able to use it more than yeah. once. So I can yeah. definitely vouch. And, and that's a, that's a, that's an important point for investors to know when they're talking with someone that's got a VA loan uh, and make sure they understand you can still use your benefit if you have enough uh, of your entitlement or left uh, to buy your new house where you're going. So yeah, that's, that's super important to know. That's a, that's a good negotiating uh, tool to use for sure. Well, well tell us about your business model, Nick. What, I mean, I know you've only been doing sub two now for, I don't know, six, seven, eight months, maybe, but uh, so certainly you've drilled this thing down. I know from our conversations, you're telling me you're looking for a certain type of house and this and that. So, so what's your business model? What, uh, what are you trying to, to do out there right now? Man, there's, there's just so much. Um, I've learned so many different aspects of real estate. Um, I'm a broker out here in Colorado. So I know the brokering side, you know, I've done wholesaling. Uh, we've done some flips. Um, at the beginning of 2021, I really had to sit down because at the end of 2020, I was just kind of all over the place with what I was focusing on. I really had to sit down with a couple of my business partners and and kind of chat about what we're going to focus on moving forward. And what we kind of determined, um, based on honestly, just the first week of January, we started doing some virtual wholesaling. And we absolutely rocked it. The first week we had six contracts already assigned. Like it was absolutely ridiculous. And to be honest, we're, we're focusing primarily in Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're also, I'm, I'm also focusing on just local sub twos. I don't really want to do out of state sub two. Mm-hmm. I just think it's easier to be able to see it and touch it. And mm-hmm. that's just how I think, because in Hawaii, when I was out stationed in Hawaii, I was doing out of state flips and that was out of necessity because, mm-hmm. you know, Hawaii markets super ridiculously priced. It's crazy. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's insane. So uh, right now, like my business model is, is virtual wholesaling, which we've developed a, a great team um, around that. We have people, um, boots on the ground out there in Alabama. And then me personally, I'm just doing some sub twos out here, out here in, uh, you know, the Denver, Colorado Springs area. Mm-hmm. So I've been hawking the expired listings and, right. and just trying to make some, some good deals. Mm-hmm. I tell you, you know, we we have access to the MLS here too, and uh, there aren't many expired listings these days. And so you really got to jump on them if, if one comes along or something like that. It's, uh, gosh, it's so competitive here now. I, you know, the last update I had said there were less than se- a seven day inventory on the market for houses. It's, I mean, and, and we say, every couple of months was well, got to stop. It's got to stop. It can't, you know, because, uh, you know, it, it reminds me so much of 2006, 2007, when we watched houses come on the market in California and, and get bid way up over asking price within hours. You know, it was a, actually a, like an auction situation out there for the MLS listed properties. It's insane. Yeah, it's it's definitely a tough market. I mean, I have some clients that have literally put in 12, 13, 14 offers on houses mm-hmm. well above list price with right. appraisal gaps and all of that stuff. And we're mm-hmm. just not winning anything. So yeah. it's a tough market to find stuff. You really have to be lucky or uh, just, I don't know, keep hawking the MLS. Like that's that's what I've been doing. And I've, yeah. I've been pretty successful. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's just like anything else, really. It's a, it's a tough market, but it comes down to consistency. Pick something uh, that you're going to go after, whether it's mailing to VA loans or going after expired listings, whether they're only two or three or, or taking those two or three foreclosures that pop up every week and being at their door when the sun comes up knocking and just doing it consistently, consistently, consistently. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, my grandfather used to tell me all the time, you know, even a blind hog finds an acorn, 
occasionally, you know, so <laughs> yeah. if you just stay after it, you know, you'll find it. So I think that's really what it all comes down to. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. I totally yeah. agree. I think, I think that's one of the most important things just sticking to it. And, yeah. you know, eventually, eventually you're going to get something. Yeah. I, we had a guy post in the forum. Uh, it's been about a year ago, probably now. And he was talking about, well, I've tried this and I tried that and it didn't work. You know, I sent three texts, and I mailed five letters and I, you know, and I'm like, man, you, you just got to give it a little bit longer than that. You know, do it, yeah. mail five letters a week for a year. OK, you can't do it one time and then expect something to happen. You, you've got to stay with it. That's that's the key right there. So I know you're I know from our conversation and then today, too, you said that uh, you look for expired listings, things like that in MLS. What would you say right now that your best source of leads is? Now, I always I always put the question this way. Uh, when I talk to an investor, I say, hey, if you only had 24 hours to generate quality leads so you could buy a house, what would you do? What's working right now? So right now we're having amazing success with out of state vacant homeowners. Mm -hmm. um, and that's specific to wholesaling. Um, so we have two cold callers a day or two cold callers, I'm sorry, that are dialing eight hours a day each. And they're dialing three, four hundred dollars, three, four hundred leads per day each. Mm -hmm. And uh I've had great success with that. When it comes to the sub two, um, I really target the VA home loans, um, to be honest with you, just because I know how it works. They're highly leveraged. Uh, and I know, you know, from my personal experience, you get picked up and moved every eight months to two years, you know? Right. So um, it would definitely be vacant homeowners and uh, VA home loans for sure. Right. So, so you're just pulling a list from a prop stream or a list service of, uh, of uh, non-owner occupied uh, people that live out of state and you're just, you're just hitting them up, uh, just calling them out of the blue. Absolutely. And, and, and so uh, how do, how do the, how do these, these callers, because I, I'll tell you, we had this question come up in the coaching call recently. Actually, actually it was last night in our accountability group and uh, someone said, I'm thinking about starting to use cold callers. Has anybody here done it? And nobody else in the group had done it. And I've always recommended against it uh, because I've always been the point of contact with that seller. That's my area. OK, that's where you make the money. Uh, so I, I'm kind of like uh, that 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 meme you see all the time. Uh, convince me I'm wrong. Tell me yeah. tell me how this works and why it works for you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely a numbers game. Um, I personally don't like spending so much time on the, the phone. Mm -hmm. um, I hired a couple um, cold callers that are only $5 an hour each, mm -hmm. and uh, they have great American accents and uh, they, they do really well. And what I do is I just give them a, a really good script. And I totally understand that first call is super important. However, with them dialing, you know, three to 400 leads per day each, there's going to be some leads in there, whether we get them all in one day or it takes a week, um, there's definitely going to be leads. So that's kind of what's working for us. I mean, we just, I'm getting from each of those callers, I'm getting probably five or six leads per day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a nice transition for me because once they've already made that initial contact, it's very easy for me to pick up the phone and be like, Hey, you spoke to my assistant recently. I just wanted to follow up with you, get right. some you know, questions answered. And they already, they're already expecting the call at that point. So it's just right. super smooth for me. And I don't really have to worry about them, you know, cussing me out or hanging up on me. Right. So your callers just have a basic script. They're just collecting some very basic information. And then they say, Hey, okay, great. Uh, Nick's going to give you a call here today or tomorrow. And then they just pass it off to you. Exactly. Yeah, they get so, all the pertinent information and I just follow up and ask those, uh, yeah. those pain point questions. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. I, you know, I really, I, I can see what you're saying about it being a numbers game. Uh, you're going to, if you call a thousand people, you know, a certain number are going to be absolute no's and then you're going to get down to a certain number that are open to listening anyway. So yeah, 
Okay, that makes sense. All right. So tell me, Nick, about any, you're using cold callers, you farm the MLS for expires. What about any tools that you use in your business that, that helps your job be easier or get you information in a prompt fashion? Or what, what are your favorite tools to use in the business? So aside from the MLS, that's where I pull all of my expired listings. And I love the MLS because it's, you know, it's obviously extremely accurate um, mm -hmm. to the day, you know, it's updated every day. Um, another tool that I use regularly every single day is PropStream. Mm -hmm. Um, I love PropStream, you know, it gives me all of the data I need. I can pull any lists that I want. Um, so definitely PropStream and I use a service called direct skip, um, mm -hmm. to, to skip trace all the numbers. And through that, I don't, I don't know if it's the same deal for everybody, but I get like eight to 11 cents per skip, um, which is pretty decent. You know, mm -hmm. when I compare it to other services like batch leads or um, just other services, I guess, but yeah, definitely prop stream MLS direct skip and just, you know, having those cold callers. That's, that's pretty much all I use. That's, mm -hmm. that's it. I got you. Now, direct skip, that's one I haven't heard of. Uh, I, one of our conversations, again, uh, in our accountability group last night was, uh, was skip tracing services. And uh, so, you know, there were the pluses and minuses for several of the more well-known ones and, and that sort of thing. How many numbers are you typically, typically getting from direct skip uh, when you run somebody through? I mean, it's very accurate. This morning, I got a 100% hit rate. On oh, it. wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I want to say the absolute minimum I've ever gotten was like 88%. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it's in the 90s. I, oh, yeah. I, and yeah, that's pretty much get. And they're just giving the you that. one or two numbers. They're not giving you a whole list of them. One provider we were talking about last night, they'll give you 20 numbers on somebody. Of course, you may not get them with any of those numbers. Uh, so it doesn't matter if they give you a thousand, if none of them are accurate, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but I mean, are they just giving you a couple, I mean, with this skip trace service, does it give you email addresses, numbers? Yeah, it gives you everything. Yeah. So they're pretty good. Oh yeah. They're very good. It's, it's obvious. I mean, it's not obviously it's, it's very accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, I think I get five numbers per person up to mm -hmm. five numbers per person. Right. Typically the first number that we get is very accurate. The second number is like 50, 50, and right. then everything else I pretty much just throw out. Okay. But we also get email addresses. We get relative information, their phone mm -hmm. numbers, their emails. We get everything, okay. um, with their service. All right. That sounds great. Okay. Wonderful. So prop stream, I, I know I love prop stream. We use it every single day. It, it's, so, you know, in cases where investors can't get MLS access, it is probably the next best thing. Yeah. Um, it's like any other data service though. I mean, different markets, it's not quite as accurate. Uh, but as far as having information, when you already make contact with a seller, you already know in a lot of cases what they owe, what their payments are, uh, if they're in foreclosure, if they own other properties. I'll tell you that linked property feature they've added recently. That's great. That's yeah. super, super helpful. So yeah, they're a great product. The Sub2 Deal Show with your host, Sub2 expert, William Tingle. We'll be right back. Hey sub tours, have you been trying to learn how to invest in real estate? It can take you years to learn the ropes on your own. How many people do you know who have been looking into real estate investing for years, but have never bought a single house? Do you have shelves full of courses, but lack the courage to get out there and close on that first deal? Are you tired of so-called coaches who always seem to have just one more thing to sell you that you absolutely must have to be successful? Are you tired of trying to piece it all together with YouTube videos and free forms found on the internet? Is that really any way to build a business? William Tingle has been coaching real estate investors all over the country for over 16 years. And if you are ready, he can show you how to buy all the houses you want, anywhere you want, without ever having to ask a banker for one thin dime. Contact William today at sub2deals.com and schedule your free 30-minute strategy session. Talk it over, and if you think you're finally ready for success, he'll get you going. Back to the show, the Sub Two Deal Show, with your host, Sub Two Expert William Tingle. Uh, so tell me, Nick. Now, specific, you know, we are the Sub Two Deal Show, and you know, we talk about some other stuff from time to time. But in in terms of a Sub Two Deal, uh, when you get a lead for one, how do you evaluate that thing and decide 
uh, if it's a deal to you or not, what are the specifics that you're looking for in a good sub two deal? Yeah. So I'm not super picky. Um, I, I'm really not, uh, Cash flow is awesome, and I definitely prefer cash flow. Um, but at the end of the day, as long as I can mark that thing up, you know, five, ten percent, and on the back end of the the loan, get a nice payday, I'm happy with that. Right. Um, but I'm definitely targeting. I'd like to get at least two hundred and fifty to three hundred a month in cash flow with the seller mm-hmm. finance, um, and uh, just you know, mark it up, uh, interest rate, and get some cash flow and make some money on the back end. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that's what I tell investors all the time. Profit centers, we're looking, if if your model is like mine and you buy sub two and you sell with seller finance, I'm not interested in holding anything. Uh, then I'm going to get a down payment. I'm going to get a monthly cash flow. Then I'm going to get a back end uh, when these sellers, excuse me, when my buyers refinance. Uh, now, Another thing that I'll hear from time to time from people, I can't find a buyer for my property. And this is what I tell them. If you stick to the right house, you won't have any trouble getting a buyer that's got eight to 10% for you. Are you running into any problems moving these, these houses you're picking up? I've had no issues at all. You know, I'm, I'm getting the cookie cutter, you know, three plus two plus bath, um, and they're, they're going fast. You know, the first one I got, it was a great neighborhood. And I literally had that thing sold within two days of, of right. buying it. Mm-hmm. So it was, it's very fast. Yeah. So are you sticking pretty much to, to the model that I teach the 10 years old or less nice neighborhoods needs little to no work. Uh, just a nice place where you'd want to live with your family. Yeah. For the most part, I am, there are some, you know, one-offs that I'm definitely mm-hmm. looking right. at. Um, just, just because the inventory out here is so low, you know, right. I'm, I'm a little flexible there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I'm looking for something that's probably 10 or less years right. old. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, nice houses. You know, you're going to, uh, th- all of this, you know, junkers work for equity, all that stuff. I, I don't fool around with that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, I, because I'm telling you, in my experience, uh, you, you, you're showing a house, a couple comes to look at it. The wife walks through it. She makes the decision. Yep. And if it looks gross, she ain't interested. You know what I mean? Yep, exactly. <laughs> so, so you want a nice house for sure. Well, yeah. tell us, tell us, Nick, give us an example of a deal that you're working on right now. Yeah, absolutely. So just Sunday morning, um, I was hawking the MLS like I normally do. Mm -hmm. And I pulled an expired listing and it's down in the Springs actually. Mm -hmm. And I I reviewed the MLS and I saw at the bottom in the additional provisions, it said, um, oh my goodness, it said the right to sell this property has been terminated. And I was like, this is awesome. You know, the agent is basically telling everybody he's no longer working with these sellers. So I gave him a call and I was like, hey, man, what's going on? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Why didn't it sell? It sat for only two months. It wasn't mm-hmm. super long. Right. But but kind of unusual for this market. But he he kind of gave me a whole backstory on it. Uh, the property, they just purchased it about a year ago. Um, they didn't have enough equity in it. And they recently took out a loan for some solar panels. So that also went, you know, against the debt on the house for an end buyer to pick it up. Right. Um, So that particular property, he ended up giving me the owner's information. Um, I gave, I gave her a call and she just spilled everything to me. She's, she wants to move to Arizona. Um, Her, her uh, adult son lives with her and he's going to stay locally, but she wants to just get out of this house. And I explained the entire sub two process to her. And she told me that her all-in payment to include the solar panels is about $16.04 a month. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this property is worth about $265 and she owes $238 on it. So when you do the math, 6% interest or uh, commission to an agent plus taxes and uh, closing costs and stuff, she's going to be about breaking even. Mm -hmm. So she was super open to it. And, you know, after running the numbers in this neighborhood, I could easily get five to 10% down seller finance it five to 6% interest and cash flow. probably honestly on this one, probably 500 to $600 Mm -hmm. a month on it. Um, So that's, that's one that I'm really focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I know we're coming to the next question. You know, I ask all my real investors uh, the same questions because it gives me a good idea, an overview of their business, how they're finding leads, how they're you know making money with deals. And it also lets listeners compare apples to apples, uh, you know, when you're asking the same questions. Uh, we talked about this question before we went on today. Uh, and and about your most unusual deal. Now, I'll tell you, I've asked that question. I've, I've probably talked to 30 or 40 real investors over the course of the last two years. And uh, I've heard everything from murder for hire plots to all kinds of stuff. But I know you told me, well, I'm going to let you tell it the, about your most unusual deal. We just talked about it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, honestly... Most of my deals were, were pretty cookie cutter. Um, I never really had any major or unusual things happen. Mm -hmm. I think honestly, the most unusual thing is just having to deal with this solar panel thing, you right. know? Uh, and that's, that's actually something that I'm still trying to figure out. I think mm -hmm. that when I buy the property sub two and I have the two documents in place, the, the power of attorney and the authorization to release that, should give me some right to act on that that lease or that solar panel loan, I believe. But that's really it. I'm just trying to figure this out. I, I don't have any crazy murder for plot, you know, deals yeah. or anything right. yet. But I, I mean, I'm definitely not, uh, you know, counting that stuff out. I'm sure. I'm sure something crazy will happen over the next few years. You never know. Uh, yeah. It's it's really interesting. The longer you, you that you do this, the more you're going to run into some really weird things. I actually thought at one time about putting together a book of stories and call it the diary of a real estate investor because I mean, I'm telling you, there's some weird. You know, people are motivated for all kinds of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, they really are. So yeah, but good for you. Uh, staying with that cookie cutter, man. That's, that's, that's cool. So, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, we may have touched on this a little earlier already, but uh, it's our next question. So how did you learn to do what you do? I mean, I, it sounds like you do a variety of things. You do some wholesaling too. You're now you've picked up some creative financing, but so how did you, how did you learn to, to, to buy and sell real estate? Um, let's see here. So in Hawaii, um, in 2018, um, this is kind of tying into when I sold my first property and I did the 1031. I don't remember exactly how, but I found bigger pockets. Mm -hmm. Um, I think when I was getting my real estate license in Hawaii, I was just Googling stuff about real estate and it popped up. So a YouTube video came up and I saw some videos from them and just teaching you about real estate. So basically what happened was I just, I started listening to their podcasts mm -hmm. religiously. You know, I started from podcast number one. I completely stopped listening to music when I went to the gym on my car rides to work. I just listened to podcasts. I started reading books and listening to, to audio books. Um, and that's where it all took off. You know, my mindset changed before I was, I don't know, like in my spare time, I'd just be sitting around at the house or watching TV with my wife. And I mean, we still definitely do stuff like that. But for the most part, now in my downtime and my own personal quiet time, I'm listening to podcasts, I'm self-educating, I'm watching uh, YouTube videos on new strategies. And um, that, that's really where it all came down to. I just surrounded myself with like-minded people, started attending real estate meetups and I ended up starting hosting one with a buddy of mine in Kailua, uh, Hawaii, on the uh, the east side. And uh, we just had a great turnout, started meeting people. And that's really where it all you know started, mm -hmm. just self-education and surrounding myself with people. Yeah. Yeah. When I got into real estate, I know it just, uh, it just felt like home, you know, and I just, that's all I wanted to do was listen to uh, podcasts weren't as big back then, but listen to CDs, listen to cassette tapes. We still had those back then, uh, all kind of courses, uh, joining different groups. Uh, the internet was, it wasn't new exactly, but we didn't have things like Facebook. We had internet news groups, which was just posting and responses and, and things like that, man. That, I stayed in those all the time. I forgot about television. I didn't have any other hobbies, but real estate, I loved it. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty much all I do at this point. Besides, mm -hmm. I was, today's a beautiful day. I was just outside standing in my driveway, staring at like the people across the street, like I was some crazy person <laughs> absorbing the sun. Yeah. But this is, I mean, when I'm not, you know, outside or hanging out with my family, I'm just, you know, learning real estate, uh, putting deals together, right. you know, doing some cold calls, but I live and breathe it. Yeah. Well, let me let me jump in and ask you something. I know you're a, an agent and you, you're an active agent in the market. And this is a question that comes up all the time with uh, investors. And, and I, I tell them, especially if you're working remotely, I've done that for the last 11 years. I've worked remotely. Uh, and, and finding one of your key people needs to be a realist, one or more real estate agents. They can do so many things for you. They can bring you prospects, uh, sellers that don't have equity if they're not, if the agent's not an investor and doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, they can bring you potential buyers. You know, I know as an agent, the first thing they want to do with you when you walk in uh, to their office is pre-qualify you because they don't want to waste time showing you a thousand houses if you can't even buy one. And I know from time to time, you guys run into buyers who have money for down payments, but they can't get qualified. And a lot of times you can't help. So if I'm buddies with you and you're not an investor, uh, if, if we're friends, you can refer them to me for a fee or, or just that sort of thing. MLS access. I mean, all kinds of things agents can do for you. And, and I even had this trouble when I first got started. I couldn't find an agent that wanted to work with me. If, if I'm a new investor and, and I call you up because I'm looking for an agent to work with, how do I need to handle that conversation to make it more likely for you to help me or to be a part of my team? Yeah. So that's, a, that's, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough question. I mean, I've had this question a couple of times from multiple different people that reach out to my team and are asking for, uh, you know, help getting started with either wholesaling or um, I had, I had this one guy reach out to me. He's probably 18 or 19 years old. He wanted to get into a house hack, um, but he didn't have enough equity. But basically what I told him was, you know, you, you got to start saving up your money, uh, start analyzing deals. Um, and just when, you know, when it's time to buy, I'll, I'll definitely help you out. But um, what can people do? I'm sorry. Can you ask me again? <laughs> sure. If, if, let's, let's, let's take, let's take the fact that, that you're an investor out of the equation. Let's say that you're just a real estate agent. That's yeah. what you do for a living. You, you talk with sellers, you list houses, you sell houses. That's what you do. Now you're an investor. So it's going to be a little bit different. If you yeah. run into a seller, if you go to a seller meeting and they don't have enough equity, you're going to shift into investor mode and yeah. you're going to try to buy their house. But let's take that out of the equation for a second. You're not an investor. You're a real estate agent and I'm a new investor and I'm looking for an agent to add to my team. Someone that can refer those sellers to me, someone that can refer those buyers who have down payments but can't get qualified to me to buy my houses. Somebody that might give me MLS access as an associate or an assistant. Somebody that can be a member of my team as an, in, as an investor looking for an agent. What would be the best approach with you to make it more likely for you to work with me? So if people wanted help and I had access to sellers that didn't have a lot of equity, um, or they just needed help unloading properties, right? I would be more than happy to help them list it for mm -hmm. them for a small fee. You know, right. I know that, um, you know, let's say that a seller doesn't have enough equity, but I know somebody that is interested in buying a sub too. I would love to maybe once they close on it, maybe list it for them on the MLS for a mm -hmm. flat thousand or $2,000 fee. You know, that, mm -hmm. that would be enough pull, I guess, from them to get me to, to work with them or be on their team. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much it really. I mean, I'm, I'm super open to working with anybody. Right. Um, so it really comes down to if we can make a win-win situation out of it, you know, um, or maybe future deals, or you want to buy a house in the future or something, you know, and you work with me, I, I'd be happy to share mm -hmm. or spread the love any right. way I can.
Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Well, Nick, tell me this. If, if you're giving advice to a new investor just getting started today, uh, what would that be? So for anybody brand new, just getting started, I would definitely say, you know, build the foundation first. Um, Listen to some podcasts, read some books, you know, maybe try to provide value to somebody in your market that's already doing what you want. You know, maybe go hang out with them, buy them lunch, uh, pick their brain a little bit. And, uh, you know, once once you build the foundation, just start networking with people, you know, start attending uh, real estate meetups. start talking the language, start analyzing deals. Um, and then once you, you know, maybe have a couple months worth of education and you've listened to a bunch of podcasts and read some books, take action. You know, I think that's probably the most important step. I know a lot of people with the analysis paralysis and they don't take any action. Um, once it comes down to you having enough education and having, you know, a pretty, decent idea of what you're doing you just need to pull the trigger mm-hmm. you got to take action you got to jump in you just got to do it because right. you shouldn't you shouldn't wait to know everything before you take action you should mm-hmm. take action and kind of learn as you go right right you know that's what i tell members of our coaching group all the time don't wait until you know everything you can pick up the phone and call a seller today uh, you need to have a general idea about the information that you need to know you know, how much they own the property, you know, what they need to get out of it. Uh, You need to have a general idea about what houses are worth in the area, but get out there and do something. You can, so many people want to do busy work. They want to uh, collect lists of, of possible sellers and read another course or listen to another, you know, ebook or, or whatever it may be, but you need to get on the phone. You need to start meeting with some sellers and getting some contracts. Then we can walk you through the deal and fill in the blanks. Exactly. You got to build that confidence. You just got to start doing some stuff. And, you know, that's, that's kind of where I struggled at first. Um, Mm -hmm. I hated, I hated picking up the phones. Mm -hmm. I I, I couldn't do it. It, You know, it just something in me that just prevented me from dialing people. It just Mm -hmm. scared me. But now, you know, that I've done it plenty of times and um, it's, it's absolutely nothing. You know, you learn as you go, you build the confidence and you're definitely going to be successful. Yeah. Everybody's worried about getting, you know, chewed out or hung up on and, You know, that's going to happen, but it's so rare. Most people are actually pretty cordial. You know, sorry, uh, I'm not interested. Uh, We want cash only. Put them in follow up and move on to the next call. And if somebody cusses you out or hangs up on you, okay, next. You know, you just go on. It's not like they punched you in the nose. You know, they're on the other end of the phone. It's not, it doesn't have to be scary. So, well, Nick, I'm asking some great information today. It was really great to have you on. Tell me uh, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, if, you know, as an investor in the area that wanted to work with you or somebody that hears this, that has a house they want to list or anything, how would they get in touch with you? So you can email me. My email address is Nick, N-I-C-K at the FI team.com, the F-I team.com. And then also, Facebook. Um, feel free to, you know, look me up on Facebook, Nick Monge. I'm not on Instagram much, but those are probably the two best places. Okay, great. We'll uh, get that out there in the show notes and so everybody can get in touch with you. So Nick, thanks again for being here. Uh, man, you're, you're just killing it. So just keep it up and uh, it was a pleasure having you today. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Sub tours. That is it for this episode of the sub two deal show podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode, along with a complete transcript at sub two podcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would subscribe and give us a five star rating and review on Apple podcast. It only takes a minute and it helps others discover the show. Uh, Join us in our free Facebook group at sub2forum.com. And until next time, keep learning, keep talking to sellers, and you will buy some houses. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.